Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by a special guest. I like to call him the godfather of vintage drum interviews, uh, a huge inspiration to me, Mr. Jim Messina. Jim, how are you? That would be me. Hello, Bart. <laughs> I want to thank you for uh, inviting me. Did, you know, I, Hey, did you know this is the first time I've ever been interviewed myself? This is very unusual for me to be on the receiving end. I'm used to being where you're at. Exactly. I did not know that. And I'll tell people that um, Jim is just an absolute icon in the vintage drum community. He has and runs vintage drums talk dot com and is just kind of a legend on YouTube. And full disclosure, he is absolutely one of the main reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing today, because I sat there on my couch and watched all of his videos and said to myself, wow, I absolutely love this. How can I get involved? I want to learn and I want to kind of do what Jim does. And look at us today. I'm talking to you and interviewing the man himself. I'm turning red here, Bart. I'm very flattered. But you know what? You are an example of the the type of person I was trying to uh, communicate with all these years. Uh, because uh, I understand you're you're still in your twenties, aren't you? I am twenty nine. Exactly, and that's the you know when I would be doing these uh, these videos, I'd be talking to you, someone just like you out there, your age group, because somebody's got to take over and put some value on these drums. And I, I'm so glad that that you've created this podcast and that you exist, because really. The community has to live on. Somebody's got to uh, educate themselves the, from the younger uh, aspect. And I'm so glad you're doing that. And thanks for the compliments. Oh, my pleasure. And and I think it's um, it, it's amazing how many topics come up that you I had no idea they existed that I've learned in the process of making this show. And today's topic of painted bass drum heads from the, ah, the 20s yes. and 30s which we're going to talk about. And the reason I'm talking to you is because you have a great video on YouTube, which I will link to in the show notes where people can find Terrific. it. Terrific. But um, jumping into today's topic. Now, go ahead and treat this like, uh, like I think a lot of people don't know anything about this subject. Uh, maybe they've seen them. Maybe, like, honestly, like we were talking about before we uh, hopped into the interview here, People think of like a printed logo on a bass drum head, um, all that stuff. So take us to the very beginning of painted drum heads. Why are they painted? What's the point? Here's how it actually goes. Here's how it goes. You have to start off with calfskin heads in general at first because, you know, back in the 20s, the teens, 30s, and into the 40s, you know, Remo Belly had not come along yet with mylar heads, plastic mylar heads that we know of today and all the variations that exist. And you see, you know, a lot of graphics, some really well done graphics for everybody now. Everybody on stage has, you know, a cool looking, you know, some kind of logo bass drum head. Uh, but back in those days, it's all because of the need to maintain calfskin heads. Calfskin heads, they're animal skin, all right? Yeah. And they react to humidity, all right? So you, you could tune up your, first of all, you had to stretch your own heads. You had to tuck them. That's what they called it, tucking a calfskin head. You would, you know, the, the aluminum rings you see around uh, conventional uh, contemporary drum heads, uh, yeah. that the mylar is wrapped around. Okay, well, that was called a flesh hoop back in the day, 20s, you know, the calfskin head era. They were usually made of wood, maybe a maple ring. They had a, It had a scarf joint in it, and they were, sometimes they were rounded. Sometimes they were had a flat side to them. But drummers were very familiar with tucking their own calfskin heads with a tucking tool. Uh, you can use, uh, they, they suggest if you don't have a, a, an actual tucking tool, you can use a wide spoon, the handle of a spoon or something mm -hmm. like that to do the actual tucking. What you would do is you would buy 
a round of calfskin. That's what they used to sell. You could get them pre-tucked if, if you wanted to, of course, if you had to pay a little more sure. for that. But they came pre-tucked, and some guys would carry around maybe four or five, six pre-tucked heads, the batter head, and they had the snare head, what we call the snare head now, for the bottom side. But then, in calfskin terms, it was called a slunk head to use on the bottom hmm. for the snare side. And they were usually a thinner, shaved type of head, okay? Whereas the yeah. top, thicker, white, usually, usually Irish calfskin was considered the best. But my whole point for mentioning calfskin, getting into it at all, is that calfskin, once again, reacts to humidity. And what happens is you'll tune up, the guys would tuck their heads, put them on their drums, tune them up, get them where they want them, and then it would be raining out <laughs> or foggy yeah. out yeah. or just a, uh, just a hot, sticky, humid day. What happens to the head? It starts to loosen. It starts to sag because it reacts to the moisture in the air. And your drums would just literally sound, just they just go splat. <laughs> so, the, so these drummers would quickly take their drum key and they're, you know, constantly throughout the whole set, turning this one, turning that lug, turning this lug. It was just a big, big pain. I don't know how they got through that era, to tell you the truth. And I'm glad <laughs> that I was born at a time where, you know, Remo Belly came along yeah. and here we've got Mylar heads. But yeah. so you had these sagging heads. They couldn't take it. They had to fix this somehow. So what they did was they started installing uh, heaters inside of bass drums and snare drums. I've never actually seen them inside a tom, but I imagine they could have done that also. But you mostly see them bass drums, snare drums. And it was just a heated element that would warm up. And you had to kind of be careful because, you know, <laughs> you don't want your drums to catch on fire, but uh, they would plug it in, the thing would heat up, and it would help their sagging calfskin head. It would keep the heads, keep the tensions where they want them. So that was one way to do it. Then the other way to do it was by using simply a light bulb or two light bulbs, two and three, okay? And the heat generated by the light bulb was just enough to take out the humidity and from the air within the bass drum and keep these heads, you know, intact where you tuned them, at least for the gig. You know, then you turn off, then you sure. turn off the lights or the heater, take the uh, trolley home, pack up your stuff, you don't take the trolley and they'd go flat again. So they noticed that, hey, wait a minute, that really looks elegant and cool when, when I turn that light on like that inside the bass drum. Uh, then they started putting in a red red one and a blue one, you know, colored ones. Hmm. Then they started putting in, they started, they figured a way to make them blink. Oh, wow. So you'd have, you know, I've, some of the some of these bass drums that I've taken apart, you know, when cleaning them and restoring them, there's this, you know, pretty dangerous looking <laughs> frayed wiring and all this <laughs> stuff and ceramics. You know, ceramic uh, stuff to, to, to screw the bulbs in. Yeah. But there would be a red bulb and a blue bulb. And they, they, they would literally be painted because the paint would be cracked, all, you know, checked from the heat of the light bulb. The bulb would be painted on there, you're saying? Literally hand painted. Oh, geez. That, Lead paint on a bulb. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that's what I would find. But... Then they started adding, you know, something to make them blink in sequence, back and forth, back and forth. And then they said, that really looks elegant and classy. And the orchestra leaders, you know, the band leaders loved them. And, uh, it, you know, they'd be playing a huge supper club. And there the drummer has with this, this moody looking bass drum that, you know, was lit up. And little did the people know that, the lit, the lit up bass drum was 
serving a, a purpose other than aesthetic, you know. So they thought, wait a minute, what if we did like a, a silhouette type painting on the bass drum? And that's the birth of painted drum heads. They started, you know, with, with maybe just their initials, maybe. I don't know which came first, initials sure. or these really cool paintings. But I believe that, you know, the drummers started doing it themselves before the companies, the actual uh, American companies started actually putting these out themselves, you know, offering them in catalogs. Drummers would, you know, make some pretty crude renditions <laughs> of yeah. painted drum heads. You know, their, their initials, the band, the name of the band, whatever, all kinds of things. And I'm, I come across many drums from pre, and most of them are pre 20s that will have these crude attempts at making the drums look good or painting them. Mm. And they eventually figured that using a certain blend of oil paints worked, whether they were thinned out or whatever. But the drum companies then realized, hey, there's a need for these. And they, they started putting them out. They hired artists. And if you search on the internet, there's only one that I know of, is a picture of a guy, actually an artist, in the factory, surrounded by paintings yeah. and drum heads waiting to be painted. And it, to me, it looks like the Leedy factory because one of the drums, and these they, they and he would mount these uh, the drum heads on the same type of apparatus that they used, you know, to tuck the heads and store them. Remember I told you the drummers would buy uh, pre-tucked heads? Yeah. Well, there was a rack system that was used, just wooden slats and long screws and, and wing nuts to keep these drum heads in shape. And it would just it look like a stack of pancakes, to tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll share that that photo is unbelievable of the guy sitting there painting it. Um, I've You've seen, seen it. Yeah, it's yeah. Just... and it's funny because I always remember it because he has such an odd haircut where he has no sideburns and his <laughs> hair is, is shaved up. You guys listening will look it up and, and see that. It's funny. See, now uh, back when I was doing this, no internet really to speak of that had a lot of images. But now if you Google, you know, with the help of Google and you go Google images painted, you know, 1920s painted drum heads, You'll see just a billion, and yeah. they're great. Yeah. Uh, Rob Cook also includes them in, uh, in some of his books, but this these are great because they're you know these are people that own these. Uh, you know, Dave Brown has some of his up there, Mark Cooper. But if you go way back to the Rob Cook days and his publications, which to me are like the Bible. Yeah. You have some renditions in there, and you actually have, you know, the names of the head. They gave names to these heads, these paintings, whatever scene it was. And I've got some right here. Uh, the ones that I had in the video, if you haven't seen that video yet, it's an old one, one of my older ones, but uh, there's a there's a silhouette that uh, is very early. Yeah. Now, that's funny because some of the ones you see, nobody knows how many really ex came out of the factories. All we can go by are what we see in the catalogs. And, you know, Rob has published many of them in his books. I showed what I had. And there were even some more that I have that are some of those early, early ones that <laughs> came out of nowhere. You know, no catalog, no company, just some guy did it himself. But in the, in the catalogs, there are some just like drums that are more sought after than others because of their rarity. And it's usually, usually the theme is like the uglier they are, the more rare and valuable they are now. Yeah. But back in those days, back in those days, just like the vintage drums themselves, they weren't made to be collectible. We, 70 years later, 80 years, we 
are the ones that are valuing them. But they weren't produced to be, you know, nowadays, you know, they make the such and such anniversary uh, version of this and that, you know, and the Lars Ulrich model. I just, <laughs> the way, sure. that's a vintage, and, but, I, but I've got to be level-headed about it and say, even someone your age might say, yeah, you got a Lars Ulrich? Damn, that's yeah. great. Yeah. You know, now, vint- vintage drum. Okay, I'll allow you that. But to me... <laughs> Mark Cooper and I have laughed about that a lot. In fact, I think that's where I even got that from him. The Lars Ulrich model, as though that's <laughs> some vintage. super collectible drum. Yeah. But it could be just to someone who's younger. All the guys you've been talking to are, you know, the diehard. They're the old regime. You know, they're into, like I am, 1920s, 30s, 40s. And I've said that before in my videos, you know, and then I'll say, why do I own this? Why do I have this? If you saw that little video, what am yeah. I doing with a set of North drums and, <laughs> and these Mardi Gras Rogers? Well, collectible, just because they're collectible. That's why I would snatch them up. But anyways, yeah. back to the, the paintings. Uh, some of them, like I said, are more valuable, more rare, more desirable than others. And I have my version of a Holy Grail. Okay. And that particular one is called the Balloon Dancer. Okay, uh, Ludwig, or Ludwig and Ludwig. And it was basically made from 1935 to 1940. I've never seen one. And the only one I've seen is in black and white in a picture. I don't know what the color configuration is, uh, but I don't know. They're, but the most common ones you see... Every company put out, you know, a mountain lake scene. Yes. Uh, And they're slightly different. Some of the companies would even have two different versions. I'm looking at it right now. The Ludwig mountain lake version. They had a 1927 and a 1930. Slightly different. But, you know, experts could point that out. And I've seen many more of the 1930s than the 1927 versions. But if you're a collector, I mean, it's cool to have both both of them. Then there's a Niagara Falls, 1924 to 34. I've seen that, but they're 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 kind of rare. The Clipper ship is simply a silhouette of a, you know, like a Christopher Columbus type sailing ship. But it's it's done all in a in a silhouette. That one I have seen at the Chicago show. And I just, you know, next time you see me, I'll allow you to kick me. I should have got, I should have gotten that one. Should have bought it. Well, it's neat to see, because obviously if we, if we kind of back up and we remember that this is a backlit, there is, uh, there is heating element and there, or there's light bulbs inside of the drum and it's being lit. So that's why there are these silhouettes. And the one that I see a lot online um, or on pictures of people's collections is the spider web girl that you'll see. Absolutely. The... That to me is another one of my, you know, you'll see, you'll see that at the show. Yeah. Uh, I think Dave has one, Dave Brown. Uh, but I have seen him at the show and it's just so cool to see him in person because everyone is different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even with these mountain lake paintings, I look at them, and I'll look at you know the Leedy version. Even even I'll look at two or three of the nineteen thirty version Ludwig version, and I'll see. Hey, wait a minute, a little different, because you've got the human element involved. They yes. were literally hand painted, and you know we all use that term painted, but there was little brushwork involved. Because the problem was, just as you say, being backlit, and I found this out the hard way because I tried to do it myself. I tried to make my own cool painting using yeah. oil paints, regular Grumbacher oil paints. Didn't It was just horrible. You could see every brush stroke and the oil in the paint starts being absorbed into the head. So you have this big outline around what you're painting of oil 
that is now being backlit, backlit by the light bulbs. It shows up. So what they had to do was they had to cut the paint a certain way, thin it out, and make it work so that you didn't get that oil spreading, just like I did. And they had to really watch it with the brush strokes. So mm. instead, they utilized a different method called the stipple method. You've heard of a stipple gold snare drum, right? Yep. I don't know if you have. Okay. But I have, yeah. The finish is basically, you know, a plaster looking finish. But when you take a sponge, and if you look at the trees and all that, you can see, and you've and, and this method is used a lot by uh, some of those quick artists that you see like at a fair, a street fair, or in a mall. They'll they'll have a way of making, you know, either an Elvis picture or a waterfall picture or a galaxy picture. They're doing a show themselves, working real fast, and they you know. Make one, and then make another one, and then make another one. Exact same method, exact same waterfall. You know, so they've got it down. Somebody showed them how to do it. And they use sponges. And they use a cloth wadded up, dabbing it. That's called the stipple method. Hmm. And wow. they'll take their brushes, and instead of, you know, drawing the brush downward or sideways or whatever... They would dab the brush, just point, you know, punch into the yeah, head. sure, dab, dab, dab. And if you go and look closely at the bushes, the trees, you can see, yeah, I can see how that was done by them stabbing at at the drum head and making you know. And they were really, they really had skills to be able to do that. And then when they would make like the calm looking water, they would dab it first and then smear it somehow with the cloth just so you didn't, they, they mastered the way to not get those brush strokes. It's, it's amazing when you when you consider the content as they went along. Remember, they started out with these crude initials, uh, Joe Blow's orchestra, Maybe the name of the the nick the nickname of the drummer it could even be like a, a hotsy totsy you know nude woman. It was just really amateurish kind of looking. But the, the, the companies hired artists that mastered this technique. And if you ever get to see them, you know, real not pictures, you can you can. You can really look at it if you're, and if you're allowed to hold them and hold them up to the light, it's it's cool. Now there are guys out there that are that are really really experts, really experts at the history of this. They even know some of the names of the artists, you know, like that maybe resided at uh, Leedy. They may say, uh, oh, there were five or six known employees that that's all they did. They worked in the art department, and they did the paintings. And these guys are so good that they could say, oh, that's so-and-so did that one, and this looks like so-and-so's work. Yet it's the mountain lake scene. They both did this same painting that, you know, Ludwig and Ludwig wanted them to do. You know, the Ludwig and Ludwig or Leedy or whoever would choose certain ones certain paintings and they would that they would include in their catalogs. And I don't know if they really did custom work. They probably did, but you just probably had to pay more for it. They didn't, you know, nothing catalog. That's why I have one here. And if you go watch the video of mine, eh, I think it's right behind me in the video, but it's a ship on the ocean sailing. Never, I've never seen it in any catalog. But the painting is done so well that I believe it to be, you know, a factory painting. There are other ones that you can tell, not factory. Even though it's done well, you can just tell. And if you study these long enough, they become burned into your brain. And you'll start to know which ones are popular, just like a, a set of blue Vista lights. They're everywhere. Yeah. There's certain ones that you you always see and like like 
you're absolutely right where you, you're saying that these guys are like master painters. And I'm sure, again, everyone should Google it and you can see. It almost reminds me um, in a great way, like Bob Ross, you know, the famous like PBS painter. They have these, absolutely like, these, <laughs> this, this yes. beautiful, like the reflection on the water. But to be able to convey that to someone else like Bob Ross did, he would say, you know, whisper into that whispery <laughs> voice, just, <laughs> yeah. just grab your number two brush yeah, and uh, just dab it like this. Boom, 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 boom. You know, basically that's the same thing the guy at the mall in the street fair is doing, only he's doing it lightning fast to make a show out of it. And then he'd spin it, you know, and rely on the, the paint, you know, running off this centrifugal force. And it, it's a show in itself, but you can tell these guys have painted these, these same paintings a million times. Sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's cool. I really, I really wonder how many were put on. I don't know if there's a record of it somewhere, but that would be cool to know. Or if just the mountain lake scene was the one everybody liked. Yeah. Uh, Again, my favorite, just because I'm a, from a collector standpoint, is the balloon dancer. Um, and there's there's another one. I don't know if you have access to this by right now. The Ludwig ones are easier to find, but then when you look at the Slingerland ones, they they're a little more rare. And I'm looking, you know, at Rob's book, and they are just a horse of a different color. You can tell a Slingerland painting hmm. they, I wonder they just have a different look uh, it's the difference between using chalks to make your artwork and oil painting with a brush yeah their they're, they're coloring is more vivid yes uh, the lines are not sharp they're soft lines and but the colors are more vivid they have a, a clipper ship, but they call it a night at sea. You know, now imagine how hard it would be to make a night scene in those days. Yeah. And it does, you know, it looks like, you know, a ship on water. And they, of course, they've got their version of the mountain lake. They call it Scotland. And it's number 822. Yep. They give it a catalog $12. Number. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, a lot of these are... Uh, Winter scenes, you know, there's the cabin in the wood, woods, the log cabin. That's number 823. Uh, I think I think Ludwig did one, too. Yeah, Ludwig did one, too. Uh, in 1930, they call it the winter scene. Some of them, so we're talking about the winter scene, and it's kind of funny to me. Some of them are a little bit, um, I don't want to say depressing, but uh, some of them are like, like I'm looking at, uh, in, a, in a catalog, which you guys can find online, Summit Castle Scene, number 824, it's just kind of um, like the trees are barren, and it reminds me of, I talked to Mark, Mark Cooper about it, about the one that was like, I'm not sure which company, but it was the Forest Fire, which is a super rare one, where um, it's even hard to Google and find an image of it, but where there is literally a fire, like the forest is on yes. fire. Yes! I'm trying to think who made that. But it's it's a I pretty grim scene, obviously. I know, I know. It's it's unusual because even uh, Lily Lake, number eight twenty five of the Slingerland catalog, they show it's supposed to be. It's really supposed to be a sunset or a you know dusk, but yeah. it looks it has that it has that fiery sky look to it. It just what what is that you know. Why so ominous looking? Yes, exactly. Um, yet, eh, a lot of pirate stuff. There's tons of women being depicted here in the era of kind of the jazz, the um, almost that great Gatsby-ish. Absolutely, the Roaring Twenties. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of the balloon dancer comes under that category, but yeah. I see, I've got, I'm looking at Slingerland and Ludwig and Ludwig next to each other here and they, they again it seems like every company figured wow well, we gotta do a mountain lake scene mm -hmm. okay we gotta do a cabin a winter scene with the cabin ludwig's got two of them uh i don't know why they do that why they have two of them but yeah you know, one is 1927 and then again they change it like up again in 1930 
don't know why they, unless that's when the catalogs were put out, but they chose then to change the look of the same subject matter. Yeah. But then you'll see pirates again in both Slingerland and Ludwig and Ludwig. And it's like they, I don't know if they were dueling it out. Of course, there's the infamous windmill scene that they all had. Lady, I've got two ladies now. Uh, one is mounted on a 28-inch bass drum, and this one blows me away now. I have another one that is in mint condition. Now, a lot of times when people say mint, they don't know what they're talking about. But when collectors or any high-profile collector or person in the drum community, vintage drum community, says mint, they mean mint. This came from Dave Brown over in England, and I traded the low boy pedal yeah, for it. Yeah. Uh, he wanted it that year. He would just, oh, Jim, of course, I have that. Uh, what do you want for it? Uh, and I said, geez, Dave. And I, you know, I kind of regret that because, you know, I wish I had that back. But hey, Dave's got it. It's in a great place. But at the time, I kind of told him, wait, I don't know. I, I need a 25 and a half inch painted bass drum head of, you know, the windmill scene. And I can't believe it. He just, I've got one. I've got one. Yeah. Do you want to? Do? What? what? What are you doing? First of all, to have a, you know, a 25 and a half inch was, is, is hard to find. Sure. 28s. That's this, this era is, you know, everything was 28 inches mostly. And then they would go down to 26, but to have a 25 and a half, you could mess with a 26, but they really did make 25 and a half exactly to fit a 25 and a half inch shell. He had one in mint condition. And when Dave says mint, I mean, I was shocked when I received it. It was beautiful. And, you know, it's a, it's, I think it's the leady version of the windmill scene. That's unbelievable. And it's just beautiful. I, I, I got to send that to you. You're going to, you're going to be knocked out. But because I also have another lady windmill scene, which has a rip in it, and there's you know some other problems with it, but I'm just fascinated with them to tell you the truth. And the, it's funny that the way they came about it was all it was it was necessity because of the humidity with capskin heads and the evolution. It went through the teens, and by by the time the twenties rolled around, the drum companies figured. We got to start making these, and we're going to catalog them. And I'm not sure when the actual first catalog, you know, had painted drum heads in them. If it was, if it was Leedy, if it was Ludwig. Uh, I mean, Ludwig is showing 1927, even 1924, but I've even seen like 1923, and so. I'm not sure when they started. I don't know. Did Mark Cooper ever mention? N no, he didn't. But I'd also be curious about when did they end? So do you know when they, they ran their course and kind of went out of style? Would that be? Well, let's put it this way. The balloon dancer went to 1940. Okay. As late as 1940. That's the latest I've got. Um, but again, some by that time, some people were getting it down with the the painting, you know, doing it themselves, especially band leaders that, you know, wanted their name or their initials on the bass drum. Benny Goodman. Yep. You know, that's a famous head. BG, you know, with the with the lines and the shield and all that. But by the 50s, in the middle of the 50s, they were still doing calfskin because WFL, I got a whole set of WFLs with calfskins. And by the in mid '60s, in the uh, in the late '50s, I think Remo Belli really started, you know, promoting them. So, the way of the painted head was over with. Yeah. Probably in into the early '50s. Okay. That's what I'm gonna say. But yeah, catalog wise, I can't I can't pin it down. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, it's, it's such an interesting and unique 
and really beautiful piece of history where they're works of art. Um, and like you said, it's that exactly. unique, unique kind of style. And um, yeah, and there's actually something cool. There's You can look on Facebook and Instagram and all these places. There are people who are doing great jobs of reproducing these heads um, on 28-inch bass drum heads. It's it's obviously yep. different than the original, but but if you can't find the original, why not have um, someone I, well, creating I, something new? Yeah, I don't know if there's you know a copyright on them. I really don't know. But all I can say is I've seen you know the ones that Matt Alling was putting out of CT Pro Percussion. Believe it or not, his mother was doing these paintings. Oh wow! We had them at the show two or three years ago. When he was when he when he brought the uh, we call it the cigar band set drum set. Awesome set. If you look up CT Pro Percussion Matt Alling, or you could probably even put in cigar band drum set. You know, Google that. He was <laughs> I can't believe it because it's painstaking. He used real cigar bands and made a wrap oh, out wow. of them I'm for a drum at it. set. Unbelievable. He, isn't that something? He yeah. wrapped a whole kit. So anyways, I guess, you know, they're all artistically talented. His mother then was making the drum heads. And I think one of my videos where I uh, did a segment on Matt in the background, and we talked about it. There were these, he was offering calfskin heads because he's, he's very big on, you know, fresh new calfskin heads. Um, he recognizes, you know, the older, you know, the originals as being collectible, but not playable. Sure. Big no-no. Yeah. I mean, he'll say they're like cardboard. <laughs> he'll, he'll say they're all dried out. And, yeah. You know, I think I even sat down at a set that year and just did a little ditty, a little demo, and the feel of them was pretty cool. Uh, speaking of, you know, contemporary painted heads... I think you're going to start seeing more of them just for the heck of it. Yeah, I think you're just right. Just because collector, and I think it'll be by somebody like uh, Frankie Benali or somebody like that. Collectors, I think, would would value something like that. Because anybody else is going to, you know, go to a computer guy and have them, you know, really made up all these satanic figures and all that <laughs> kind of stuff that they do now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. But as far as real painted heads... I think it's going to be collectors that are going to would be interested in something like that, and if they ever do, uh, if they ever are allowed to reproduce those exact heads, because why haven't they done it already? Yeah, they would have. They would have already done it. Yeah, and I've seen a few online where I think people just look at it and kind of. Uh, you're right. It's an interesting thing with copywriting, and can you copyright the image of a you know. The, Sp the spider lady, I believe, has been done because, once again, you can tell, you know, how I've told you that, you know, you because, look, as collectors, we may, it may as well be like being kids looking at comic books. You memorize everything on the page. Yeah. So you stare at these examples forever and ever. And your mom comes in and goes, what? What do you put that book down? You know, but wait, it's a lady something, you know. Uh, and I'd just be staring at it. You literally do almost memorize every stroke of that's on there. And I've seen the spider lady or an attempts at the spider lady. They sure, just yeah. look kind of block blockish, crude, uh, nice, nice try, but you know, and I'm glad, you know, that you revere this, not you, but the person yeah. uh, that you revere this, this painting and recognize it as one of the coolest ones that ever made. But you know, Nothing like the real thing, baby, as they say. But um, I do think somebody's going to do that. Yeah. But it's got to be Slingerland. It's got to be Ludwig. <laughs> you know, you got Bill Ludwig out there with, with WFL3. I don't know if he would ever put any stock in doing some kind of painted head, action, like they did in the old days. Or I could see uh, one of the newer companies who's doing the rusted stuff uh, oh a a l a and f a and f yeah actually a and f that's a great idea because their 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 look is so yeah. vintage even down to the strainer that they chose to use 
just because of its vintage look. Yeah. Uh, the George Wade one. And and their look is just, you know, each way each set is different because of the what they're doing with the rusted look. And I could see them somehow yeah. either either uh commissioning someone that does have the copyright to make to have those made or get permission somehow. But that's that's a company I could see doing it. There are some other boutique companies that I could see that could use that. But I'm telling you, they're works of art. I, you know, when I see them, I have to get them. Because, you know, just like the 60s drums that I do not collect. Mm -hmm. I've got enough to say that people could say, oh, he collects them. No, I don't. (laughs) I just appreciate them for their collectability. I know that somebody else, you know, I'll put them out there and try and sell them and all that to to the right person. (laughs) Like the North drums, I managed to put those in the right place. I don't want to sell them to just anybody. I, you know, they've got to be interested. They've got to have a knowledge of what they are. So anyway, it's the same with the paintings. If they ever go, they're, they're going to go to the right person. You talking about the North drums and all that stuff that we're referring to on your YouTube page. Um, I think as we've wrapped up with the um, kind of the history of the painted heads of, of how they just kind of they went away with uh, the the Mylar heads and Remo coming out with um, that technology, which there was a debate between Remo and Evans that was on a previous episode, which I will not open that can of worms again. But um, so uh-huh. <laughs> why don't you take this opportunity to tell people um, where they can find you? Because I, I can speak from personal experience that Mr. Jim Messina here is a wealth of knowledge and his videos are just unbelievably entertaining just to put on and watch on youtube so that's um, a good you know <laughs> bart that's a good way to put it you can find <laughs> me all over the internet if you just put in vintage drums talk.com that'll take you to the website okay yep then i'm sure if you look on youtube i'm still listed as gumpf one two three four that's g u m p H and then the numbers one, two, three, four. That'll be my channel. And that's where you'll find a lot of the early videos. There's a lot of it. I mean, I, I think I've done over a couple of hundred videos. Okay. Yeah. So they're all great. A lot of videos. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bart. On the website, it says uh, it's all video and it's all vintage, you know, and it is because <laughs> everything I did was on video. And then I started covering the Chicago show. Uh, most of those are on the website, but everything I've done, you can find on YouTube also, you know, separate from my channel. And I also have some things on Facebook. I've been put, putting some videos up there. Lately, if you go to drumforum.org, I'm listed. You can find some of my Chicago drum show coverage in there. I'm not really hard to find. <laughs> and now I'm on the Drum History Podcast. Yes, you are. And I think people will find it uh, kind of funny that once they watch your videos and your coverage of the Chicago Drum Show, they'll see that pretty much everyone who's been the, on the show, um, with some exceptions, have been in your videos, like Joe Luoma, Mark Cooper, Joe Boom. <laughs> I've been doing it for, what, 10 years now almost. And I, yeah, next year it'll be 10 years. I can't believe the time has flown that fast. Plus, I was doing it even before that. But I tell you, it's such an honor here for me. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever, like, granted an interview just because. (laughs) I I don't know. I I told Bart, I told Bart, I said, look, you know, there's some kind of vibe going on here. And uh, Bart, you don't know this, but I I guess I can close out with this. I, I... I do admire you for what you've done with your drum history podcast in such a short amount of time. And for your age, it fits in perfectly with today's technology. When I started doing this, it was, you know, VHS tape. There was barely an internet. Uh, You know, things were different back then. And I grew a little bit along with it, but kind of got a name for itself, uh, Vintage Drums Talk took a name for itself, got rolling. And I see that happening with you. Oh, and, thank you. Um, well, yeah, don't thank me. I mean, you deserve it. You really do. You've got, you're on the right track. I feel 
your voice, your demeanor is just right for the times. You know, uh, again, folks, I, I want you to know out there, uh, if all of you are listening that usually listen to me or watch my videos, that I'm in my 60s now and Bart is in his 20s. It's, it's cool. So I would like to take this opportunity to invite you, Bart, to co-host this year's Chicago Vintage and Custom Drum Show. I feel that you would be a fantastic partner and addition <laughs> to what Vintage Drums Talk usually offers. What do you oh, think of that? I love it. Oh, my gosh. That is a... Uh... Honestly, that I don't want like, to put you on the spot no, or anything, but I will give you a resounding yes. And that is one of the <laughs> to to think that I was watching you a year ago, <laughs> wanting to be well, there. I'm I'm in. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's kind of like my nephew Christopher, my one of my cameramen. Okay, guys. Yes. One of my cameramen is my nephew, and he, you know, was a little kid when he, you know, when he started coming to the shows with me and blah blah blah. But now he is he has gained all the success. As a as a technician, he's out on the road with Lady Gaga and Madonna and all this stuff. Okay, that's that's making a long story short, but but it's kind of the same thing. His first job, professional job, was with Tower of Power. Okay, my absolute all time favorite group. Man, we used to take him. We used to take Christopher to the concerts. So kind of what you're talking about a year ago you were watching me and now here i'm asking you to join me and <laughs> i'm glad to have you but I, I but i know that feeling of just what you're kidding me yeah <laughs> it's oh. it's a blast oh my god you, know, you, you feel like come on you're kidding you know no i'm not kidding i i see the future in you to tell you the truth you know oh i'm not going to go on forever vintage drums talk may be with you but <laughs> as far as this year I could see you and I having a lot of fun at the Chicago show. And I think the audience would really enjoy probably two of their favorite people, the Drum yeah. History Podcast and VintageDrumsTalk.com. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just honored that you're saying yes. I'm, I'm glad. Oh, and yeah. there's so much more we can do. Okay. So once again, as I always say, you know, once you get bit <laughs> by the vintage drum bug, it's all over. Jim Messina <laughs> from VintageDrumsTalk.com. <laughs> oh, I love it. Jim. Bart. Wow. Thank you so much. I am absolutely in. Everyone who's listening can look forward to that, and I will keep everyone updated. And, Jim, you and I can talk offline later. Um, cause That's right. I think this is just a perfect way to end the show on such a high note, and I am all smiles here. So, um, well, I'm elated myself because you know I think, you know, I had a great time here talking with you, Bart. So oh, I'm that's very, great. I'm excited, and I'm honored to have you do it. So, everybody out there, watch for us at the Chicago Vintage and Custom Drum Show this year. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I love you, man. Love you too, buddy. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>